Well, good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? My name is Daniel Cantor. I am the past president of the Florida Society of Neurology. That does not mean if you have any complaints about any neurologist that you can come and tell me. I'm a neurologist. I mostly see people with multiple sclerosis. I also subspecialize in headache medicine. And actually, my particular interest is headache in people with multiple sclerosis. On a side note, I also chair the subcommittee on concussion for Florida High School Athletic Association Sports Medicine Advisory Committee. Why do I bring up concussion at every single talk, whether it's the people with MS and their loved ones or the doctors and nurses? It's because the average person walking down the street doesn't care about MS. They don't care about ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's disease, stroke. Unless it affects them or a close family member, it's not something they're interested in but they care about football. So if we as the MS community want to help raise awareness, and March is a perfect time to help raise that awareness, then we're going to have to talk about things like this. There's a disease where you might have some numbness and you might have some thinking problems and you might have some headaches and pain. Well, that could be a concussion or at no fault of your own, that can be multiple sclerosis. And so by using concussion as something to draw people in, as that hook to make people who are uninterested in multiple sclerosis become interested in neurological things, it's a good way of us helping to raise that bar of awareness. That bar needs to be raised. How many people here in the room have ever been called a Jerry's kid? Anybody ever been called a Jerry's kid? So Jerry Lewis Telethon was very successful for muscular dystrophy, but in large parts of this country, there was that confusion and people with MS were called Jerry's kids. In fact, I spoke at a support group outside of Orlando, and one woman there told her best friend that she has MS, and her best friend said, my house is a mess too. As you can imagine, there is always more we can do to raise awareness. So each person, think about what your social situation is, whether you're at a job or not at a job, whether you're part of a religious community or not part of a religious community, and think about ways that you can help to raise awareness so that people can better understand multiple sclerosis, so that people can understand that multiple sclerosis affects everybody. Doesn't matter whether you're young or old, whether you're black, white, yellow, it doesn't make a difference any of these things. We have diagnosed people as young as five years old. Personally, I've diagnosed a five-year-old with multiple sclerosis. And the eldest I probably diagnosed a new diagnosis was about 77 years old. People come from all different ethnicities. It affects both men and women. People from all different kinds of socioeconomic status as well. MS affects all of us. And so it's important to help raise that awareness so people can understand it better. So what we're going to talk about tonight is, in a way, everything you need to know about MS relapses. But of course, there's a lot more you need to know, and there's a lot more that you may know personally if you're the person with MS. And actually, let's pause for a second. How many people here are not the person with MS, but are actually the loved one, so the care partner with MS? What do we do for those people? This is what we do. The care partners are the silent and not always so silent partners in what's going on in the MS journey. And it really is a journey. MS changes people's lives, sometimes for worse and sometimes for better, frankly. There are many people who I've seen who say, yeah, I wish I wasn't diagnosed, but since being diagnosed, I have changed things. I've changed my lifestyle. We're going to hear a great story from Jeff Siegel later about changing your lifestyle, changing your eating habits, changing your diet. Or I've changed my social structure, my friends. I remember a girl up in Jacksonville, when she got diagnosed with MS and she was uh, 17 years old, her friends said, oh, you have an infectious disease. We don't want to go near you. Oh, you gained weight on steroids, maybe you're pregnant. Oh, you're missing school, maybe you're in jail. Jacksonville's a tough town, I'll tell you. All of those friends, she realized, were not friends. And then she built a new foundation of friends. This was a girl who didn't want to go to college. Now she's going to college on scholarship because she was able to write stories about the things that have happened to her. So there is always a way of taking things that happen to you in life and figuring out where the silver lining is for that. The best place to find out about your MS and your relapses is not at a place like this. 
It's certainly not over food, and it's certainly not with lots of other people listening in. The place to do that is in your individual doctor's office. Speaking in that relationship that you have, one patient, one doctor, together going through the journey of multiple sclerosis. So what I hope to deliver to you today are some thoughts that you may be able to bring with you when you go to that office visit, things that you may be able to look up online afterwards, sources that you may be able to think about and use that all when you're trying to better understand your multiple sclerosis. Another way of thinking about this is how can you make your MS the most successful? Anybody know who this is an image of? So this person was ice skating and she fell and she was weak for three weeks. Then she got better. Then she lost vision in one eye and she got better after two months. Because bad things happened to her followed by good things, the Catholic Church decided that she was a saint and they named her Saint Ludwina, the patron saint of ice skating. We now think of her as being the first person in recorded Western history to have had relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. She went along fine, then she would have problems for several weeks to several months. She would have an attack, and then she would get better. And then this would happen again, and then this would happen again. Of course, they didn't understand it back in the, back in the medieval days. But now we understand better what may have been actually affecting her. For those of you who are interested or for those of you who this, who a saint does mean something to your faith, there's actually, she's actually the patron saint of ice skating. So actually on the American figure skating medal, there's an image of St. Ludwina of Scheidhem. Back in 1903, a very famous doctor, Sir William Osler, said, the best teaching is that done by the patient himself. Now, it was 1903, so we can forgive some of the chauvinism of the word himself and not herself. And he uses the word patient, and as much as possible, you'll see, I'll try to use words like person with MS. Sometimes I will use the word patient. But I think that's still true today. The best understanding that we can have of any diagnosis or any disease process is by actually talking to the person with it. So you will not see me show a slide that says, what is MS? I get very frustrated when I see slides that say, what is MS? And then a doctor is supposed to tell patients that. That's like me going over to Boeing and explaining to the engineers, what is an airplane? Doesn't make sense. You have a much more personal knowledge and an everyday knowledge of what multiple sclerosis is. So what approach do we take? The approach we take is called the multiple sclerosis team approach rule. And the basic idea of that is that the person with MS is at the center. Person with MS is at the center. On one side, you have the doctors, the nurses, the primary care physician, all of the healthcare team. Oftentimes, people think that's the center. That's not the center. We're there to be consultants to help you on this journey. Much more important is the other side, where you see the friends, the community, the loved ones. Those can be much more important in this journey. And MS does affect the job. Sometimes we're fighting for you to keep your job with the American with Disabilities Act, and sometimes it's time for disability, and we're applying for disability. And then there's the MS community. This is a rich community of not-for-profits, of patient organizations, both big and large, where people come together through support groups, through online communities, to support each other in this journey of multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, or MS, is thought to be an autoimmune diagnosis. And it's a lifetime autoimmune diagnosis. So let me talk about some of the words that I just used. I said thought to be. The reason why I'm very careful with that is that in medicine, every 20 years, half of what we know to be true is found out not just to be wrong, but to be 180 degrees wrong, to be completely wrong. And it's very arrogant for us in medicine to think that we know now what's going to be true in 20 years. The problem is we don't know now what's not going to be true in 20 years. So we go with the best that we have. And the best that we have is that MS involves the immune system. The immune system is the body's defense forces. Normally it fights off bacteria, fungus, viruses, fungi, viruses, cancers even, outside invaders. But sometimes it can get confused and get misdirected inwards. And when that happens, you get an autoimmune diagnosis. 
Anybody know any other examples of autoimmune diagnoses? So lupus, arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes type 1. So when the body attacks the pancreas, we call it diabetes type 1 or juvenile or insulin-dependent diabetes. When the body attacks the joints, we call that rheumatoid arthritis. When the body attacks lots of different parts, we call that lupus. When the body attacks the skin, we call that psoriasis. And when the body attacks the nerves and the covering of the nerves called myelin. I love that I can ask that. When I talk to headache groups, I can't ask neuroanatomy questions. But when the body attacks the nerves and the covering of the nerves called myelin, we call that multiple sclerosis. Now notice I call it a lifetime diagnosis. I think words like chronic or lifelong make life sound long and arduous. Lifetime is kind of like the cable station. Even when you're not watching TV, you're still paying your cable bills. So even when MS is not causing problems, you still have to make sure to be on treatment to try to prevent future problems. And so these are kinds of important things, is that even when you don't think that MS is happening, it's underneath it all happening in a way. And so that's why we're so careful about but trying to prevent future problems. And that's really the cornerstone of what we've been able to do in multiple sclerosis. So in 1992, there were no treatments for MS. And now we have 12 separate branded products with one branded generic that are approved just for prophylaxis or to prevent future problems. And we're going to talk about those as well. MS affects the central nervous system. The central nervous system is made up of the spinal cord, the cervical and thoracic spinal cord, it's made up of the brain, and it's made up of the optic nerves. And in fact, spinal cord is the most common first place for an MS symptom, not the eyes themselves. It involves both demyelination, loss of myelin, damage to myelin, as well as axonal loss. And then one other way of thinking about it is that it happens in people who are already genetically susceptible. Michael J. Fox, when he was describing Parkinson's, not an autoimmune diagnosis and not related to MS, but neurologic, he said that genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. The same thing could be true for multiple sclerosis. The problem is we don't understand the genetic component fully and we don't understand the environmental component fully. But don't mistake us not understanding it fully and not having a cure as us understanding nothing. We now have almost 200 susceptibility genes. Not meaning that there's a one gene that says whether you have MS or don't have MS, but it places you at a greater risk. In terms of the environment, we now know several things. We know that vitamin D is probably good for you, and we know some things are probably or definitely bad for you. What is the number one thing that you can change that hurts your MS? Anybody know? Smoking, smoking cigarettes. There is no question that smoking cigarettes leads to more attacks, more relapses, and we're talking about relapses today. It can lead to more disability progression. It can lead to more problems overall. And for people who are still taking self-injectables, it can lead to more skin site reactions. There's emerging data coming out of California that the closer you live to the highway, the higher your chances are of being diagnosed with MS. So we're learning something about environmental pollutants as well. Anybody who figures out exactly the genetics and exactly the environmental parts of MS is going to be going to Scandinavia to win a Nobel Prize of Medicine. So I said I wouldn't talk about what MS is, but I'll talk about what MS is not. MS is not fatal. MS is not contagious. It's not universally disabling. It's not a reason to stop doing the things that you enjoy. People with MS should not feel just because of the diagnosis that they should stop working. They definitely should not feel like they should not be having children. They should definitely not feel that they should somehow be not be doing the things that they want to do. There are always ways of modifying and the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation has great services where they're able to help you with modifications, with assistive technology, with other ways of making sure that you can still do the things that you love. Has anybody heard of Jimmy Hugo? So a lot of people don't know his name, but Jimmy Hugo was an Olympian. He was a cross-country skier. He got diagnosed with progressive multiple sclerosis. But that didn't stop him from skiing. He was in a wheelchair, but he would go in one of those wheelchair-type skis. So they would place him onto the skis, and he was still able to go do the things that he so much enjoyed. And each of us has to realize, as we age, whether you have MS or not, things become tougher to do. 
Your body isn't the same at 30 as it was at 20, and it's not the same at 50 as it was at 30. Whether you have MS or whether you don't have MS. And so we have to always find ways of making sure that we stay as vibrant as possible. And hopefully Jeff can speak to that a little bit later as well, because he's really a role model for that. What you see here is just to give you a little bit of an image, to give an idea of what we're talking about when we say loss of myelin and axon. And axon is the wire, the nerve. Over it, you have a cell that makes myelin. That cell is called an oligodendrocyte. And what happens in multiple sclerosis is there can be damage. So what happens is these immune cells, which we call T cells, it's just a word, become autoreactive. They cross the blood-brain barrier. And we're learning more about how B cells are involved also. Then what they can do is cause damage to the nerves as well as the covering. And that will cause the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. What happens is there are chemical messengers. We just give them a fancy name called chemokines or cytokines. And these chemical messengers can cause damage to both the oligodendrocyte as well as to the myelin itself. I expect everybody to memorize this image. And at the end, we're going to have a pop quiz where we're going to talk about the different types of things that are going on. But as you can imagine, we are learning a lot about MS and we're learning a lot about multiple sclerosis every day. And that's why it's so important for you to stay as up to date as possible. So there are several ways of staying up to date. You know, online, you have to be careful sometimes about websites. Some are more reputable than others. You have the MS Focus website, which has some good sources of information. I travel around with MS World, which is the largest all patient, all volunteer, not for profit dedicated to MS. And I act as their chief medical correspondent. And we go to scientific meetings and we talk to the researchers who are doing the research. And we post those videos within five minutes to five hours. Your doctor has to wait six months for continuing medical education. You can sit at home and the same day you can find out what's going on in a European conference or a North American conference or a South American conference. If you want to follow our videos, you can visit msworld.org or I have made a much easier link for you. And you can just go to real-time neurology, just one word, realtimeneurology.com, and you can watch the evolution of what happens in the science. It's very interesting. We were at a research meeting, and some people presented data from Scandinavia that early alcohol use, so before 18, puts you at risk for MS. Another group from Scandinavia at the exact same meeting show data that early alcohol use is protective against multiple sclerosis. And it might seem funny, right? Why are there contradictions? Well, that's what happens in the scientific process. Then there'll be a third study and a fourth study, and then there'll be a definitive study, and we'll come to understand what's going on. And that's what happens. 20 years ago, we told people not to exercise with multiple sclerosis. It's understandable why doctors said that. They were wrong. Let's be clear, they were wrong. But they said it because when you overheat your body, it can bring out older symptoms and it can short circuit things and that seemed like a problem. Now we have even research most recently that treadmill exercises, even not that fast walking, can actually improve not just your physical function, but can improve your cognitive function as well. So as you can imagine, we learn things every day and you have to really stay on top of it as well. What you see here are images of the three types of multiple sclerosis. When we talk about multiple sclerosis, there are many ways of dividing it out. One way is to talk about relapsing MS, and another one is progressive MS. Another way is to talk about relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, or RRMS, the most common. 85% of people start out that way. But then some people go on to develop secondary progressive MS. But 15% of people say, what do you mean coming better and worse and going like that? I've been getting worse from the beginning. We call that primary progressive MS or PPMS. Now, I'm going to tell you a few secrets of what happens in neurology. I hope as the past president of the Florida Society of Neurology, my neurology colleagues don't step up and get angry at me, giving you the secrets of what happens in a neurological evaluation. In a neurological evaluation, the history is so important. History, 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 and exam. That makes up 90, 80 to 90% of what we do is your history and your physical examination. That is why your doctor is asking you so many annoying questions over and over. 
uh, will tell me, does it feel like it's tingling or like it's sharp? Or does it feel like there's worms on your body or does it feel like you sat on your hand? They're asking you questions and you're like, why are you asking me this a hundred times? And that's because by asking a very detailed history, we can find out about what's going on inside your brain and inside your central nervous system. Sometimes we do actually use other tests as well. And we may use labs, so blood work. We may do a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture. We may do radiology, so we may do MRIs and other kinds of testing. And we may do electrical testing, such as evoked potentials as well. But all of that is secondary to the history and physical examination, where we're going to find out so much about what's going on with you. Remember what Sir William Osler said in 1903, the best teaching is done by the patient himself. We can learn the most by really taking a very careful history. So what's our secret? Well, there's two things that neurologists do. One thing we do is called localization, and the other thing we do is we think about the etiology. So what does that mean? Localization is just a fancy word for us saying we're trying to figure out where it's coming from. And when that happens, we're trying to say, is it coming from the central nervous system? Is it coming from the peripheral nervous system, like where diabetes, neuropathy comes from? Is it the autonomic nervous system, that whole flight or fright idea? Or is it not neurologic? That is how your neurologist, no matter where they're trained, is thinking. We might be doing it very quickly and not in that way that I'm doing it step by step, but we're trying to figure that out. Then once we have an idea of where it is, so well, this seems like it's affecting both the eye as well as the arm. So there's not one space this can be from. So when I think about etiology or what's causing it, I think about multiple sclerosis, for example. You'll notice that sometimes your neurologists will use jargon. Jargon is a fancy word that means fancy words. There is no space for jargon at all in the office. That means that your doctor shouldn't be using it and you shouldn't be using it. Don't come into your neurologist and say, I have neuropathy. Because you think you're helping me by saying, oh, you're having pain or something like that. When I hear neuropathy, I think peripheral neuropathy, I think you have diabetes. So you can imagine how words can be very, very important. So describe the symptoms that you're having, describe what you're feeling, and let us work together at figuring out where it's coming from and then the etiology, what's causing it as well. There's a triple threat to treating multiple sclerosis. And for that triple threat, I use the term MS Cateers. There's a great support group in Deltona, Florida, right outside Orlando, and they use the MS Cateers. They let me use the name. I don't know if Disney let them use MS Cateers, but I'll leave that to lawyers as well. And that triple threat are those three swords of the MS Cateers are disease modifying therapy, symptomatic management, as well as relapse or rescue treatment. Now, as we'll talk about it, disease-modifying agents or therapies or drugs, we've only been able to ever show that actual these medications can help to prevent future relapses, future MRI changes, and future disability. Unfortunately, diets have not been proven to do that. Unfortunately, exercise has not been proven to do that alone. Unfortunately, alternative medicine has not been proven. It's been looked at, all of these things, but we have yet to show that. But when we talk about symptomatic management, notice I didn't say symptomatic medications. Much of what we do does not involve medications. It involves Tai Chi, yoga, <gasps> breathing exercises, mindful meditation, and sometimes it does include medications. Most of those medicines, though, are not intended for multiple sclerosis, and we're using them in what's called off-label. So if you've ever been on anything for MS and pain, that's not FDA approved for MS and pain. If you've been on anything for MS and fatigue, that's not FDA approved for MS and fatigue. If you've been on anything for MS and cognition or thinking, that's not FDA approved. We do have a few medications that say the word MS and they're for a symptom, but mostly they're not. And then in the middle comes the rescue treatment. Now, what do you do when you're having that relapse? What's important to know is that if you are treating too many of those relapses or those attacks, that tells me your disease-modifying therapy is not the right one for you. You should not be having attack after attack after attack. The goal of the prophylactic or the preventive medicines is to try to bring down the number of attacks and hopefully bring that number down to zero. Let's first quickly talk about the disease-modifying therapies. In 1992, there were zero FDA-approved disease-modifying therapies. 
The first one was approved in 1993. Anybody know the name? Beta Ceron, or in the rest of the world, called Beta Firon. Now, in 2016, there are 12 separate branded products with one branded generic, eight different mechanisms of action. There's many ways of looking at them, but one way of dividing them is into threes, into the self-injectables, the IV medications, as well as the oral medications. And even within there, you can divide into a lot of, a lot of threes as well. And for example, with the oral medications, you can divide into the three different oral medicines. And the only thing that makes them similar is that they're oral. There's nothing else similar really about them. Or the IV medications, where the only thing that makes them similar is that they're into the vein, but otherwise there's not a lot of similarities that happen with them as well. And so this is going to be a lot of what your doctor is spending time on, although frankly most of the time in a neurologist's office is not on this decision. Once this decision is made and may be changed, and sometimes it's changed often, but really it's the day-to-day -day symptoms that you spend most of your time with your doctors about. Here what I've given you is a little bit of a picture of the approval of some of the medications as well as where we are with some future medications. You'll notice some color changes. And these color changes I had to change very recently actually. So a medication called cladribine was originally rejected by regulators because of a fear of cancer. But now it's being resent to the European Medi Medicines Agency and eventually to the Food and Drug Administration. And so we may see that oral medication come out. Laquinamon had to go back to the drawing board a little bit and look at a higher dose, which then they decided because of safety they're going to come back to the original dose. And that's another oral medication that we may see in the future. And then there are some medicines that we may see in 2016, a medicine called Declizumab and a medicine called Ocrelizumab. And then every year there's one or two new medications that are coming out. That is amazing. That is faster than most other things in medicine, not just most other things in neurology. These are proactive medications, and a patient once taught me this term. Proactive because we're trying to change what happens in the future. How many people here are on high blood pressure pills, whether you have MS or not? So when you're on a high blood pressure pill, your doctor is not trying to reduce your blood pressure because they care about the number. They're trying to do it to prevent heart attack and prevent stroke. When you're on a proactive medication, a disease-modifying therapy for MS, your doctor is trying to prevent relapses, prevent MRI changes, and prevent disability. Sometimes they make you feel better. In the past, they made you feel worse as well, but that's not actually their goal. Their goal, like the high blood pressure medicines, is to try to change the course of what's happening in your disease process. I talked about the triple threat. So the middle part of the triple threat is going to be what to do during a relapse or what to do during an acute exacerbation. Remember these images. Well, it turns out that when a relapse happens, it's that you're going along basically fine, and then you're having new changes or worsening of older symptoms. And then you're getting back to where you were, or you're actually accumulating problems along the way. So what's in a name? Many of you may be surprised that we're using the word relapse, and you may be more familiar with words like exacerbation. Anybody notice that we stopped calling them exacerbations? This is an example of where the medical field changed a word because of the patient community. Doctors got exasperated by patients using the word exasperation. And so we changed it to relapse. It's also called flares or attacks. What is an MS relapse? So an MS relapse is new or worsening of older symptoms. It's easier to see when it's new because when it's worsening, it becomes a little bit confusing as well. These are going to last for greater than 24 hours. And what's going to happen is that it's usually going to be weeks to months that it's going to last. It doesn't always come on slowly. Some people actually have a very fast symptom. And that can actually look like a stroke sometimes, and it may be rushed to the emergency room. But the normal story is that it comes on slowly, stays there, and slowly goes off. It's these waves of relapses or exacerbations that are happening as well. Now, it's important that they last for at least 24 hours. When somebody has a symptom that comes and goes during the day, we often don't think of that as a relapse of multiple sclerosis, and you want to talk to your doctor about why you're having what we call paroxysmal symptoms, symptoms that come and go. But one of the things that we want to make sure is that we have ruled out other causes, meaning that we want to make sure that you don't have what's called a pseudo-relapse. So what is a pseudo-relapse? 
The word pseudo means fake. We're not saying that you're faking. What we are saying is that it's not an actual attack of multiple sclerosis. When you take somebody with MS and you raise their body temperature, it's going to cause almost a short circuiting and older symptoms are going to come out. How many people are affected by the heat? I'm curious, how many people are actually worse than the cold in this room? And how many people feel no difference? Okay, so this is about right. So the vast majority of people are actually worsened by heat. There are some people, interestingly, that are worsened by cold, kind of like people with arthritis. And there are some people that just don't notice a difference. If you take this room and you jack up the heat enough, everybody, whether they have MS or not, is going to get heat stroke. When you have MS, you don't have to jack it up quite so high. The nerves need an optimal temperature, and when you get outside that optimal temperature, you have an uncovering of older symptoms. We call that phenomenon Uthoff's phenomenon. Back in the 19th century, there wasn't much for neurologists to do, so one of the things they did was name things after themselves. So Dr. Uthoff, a German neurologist in the 19th century, described this phenomenon. But as you can imagine, there's many things that can increase your core body temperature. They can be internal and they can be external. So things like a fever, things like ambient heat outside in the Florida sun, humidity, even when you have air conditioning on, the humidity can do that as well. And that's why it's so important that the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, as well as the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, work together in being the program services not-for-profits in helping you with things like cooling vests and other ways of making sure that you stay as cool as possible. Other things that can increase body temperature are things like stress. And that can actually raise your, someone's body temperature. I trained in Philadelphia and I saw a woman there who had a small company and she was the CEO and founder of it. And every day when she would go out there to lecture to her employees, her vision would get blurry. So there were two things going on. She was drinking her hot coffee and she was nervous. Well, I couldn't get rid of the public speaking nervousness. But what I did do is switch her coffee from hot coffee to iced coffee. That brought down her body temperature and she could go ahead and rally the troops without having that blurry vision every day. So sometimes there are very simple things that you can do to make your life a whole lot better. Everybody here has been to Dr. Google, I'm sure. And when you go to Dr. Google, almost anything you can think of is listed as a potential MS relapse. And the reason is that MS affects the central nervous system. Almost everything we do in life goes in some ways through the brain, through the optic nerve, or through the cervical and thoracic spinal cord. And so when you look up almost anything, you're going to find it. Now, some things are more typical for an MS relapse. For example, if someone has blurry vision, whether painful or not, and that lasts for several weeks and gets better, we call that optic neuritis. It's very classic for multiple sclerosis. Optic, because it's involving the eye. Neur, like nerve. Itis, like inflammation. Always ask your doctors to break down the Latin or Greek that they're speaking when they talk to you in jargon. But there are some things that could be less common for an MS relapse or less noticeable. If you've gone along and you basically don't have too much fatigue, but then you have three months of increased fatigue and you don't have depression going on or something else, and then it seems to get better, that may be an actual relapse of multiple sclerosis. The problem is it's hard at the beginning to notice that. It's easier to notice that your vision wasn't so good or that you're dragging your foot. It's harder to realize in retrospect that you've had a problem. A lot of times people ask me, how do I know if I'm having a relapse or I'm having a progression of multiple sclerosis? The way I like to do that is, for example, if you tell me you're not walking today like you did five weeks ago, that is most likely a relapse of MS. If you say I'm not walking today like I did five years ago, that is most likely progression of multiple sclerosis. It really has to do with the slope, how fast something is happening, rather than the symptom itself. Why do relapses happen? Well, what happens in multiple sclerosis is that your immune cell has gotten angry at you and it's misdirected. And then what happens is it can seep through a broken down blood-brain barrier. Normally the blood-brain barrier separates the bloodstream from the central nervous system, the brain, the optic nerves, and the spinal cord. But when that gets broken down, these cells can seep out, get into your brain, and cause swelling or inflammation in a way. And that can lead to symptoms of multiple sclerosis. And that's what happens during a relapse. 
And so there are some factors that may or may not be important in having a relapse. And they've been looked at at various times. For example, time of the year. For example, whether you smoke or not. And that we do know is related to it. Live vaccines is a little controversial, but it looks like certain live vaccines can put you at risk for a relapse. Not for everyone, but could do that. Or having an infection. Sometimes people have an infection and they have uncovering of older symptoms, so they have UTOFs phenomenon, but then that infection actually does cross over and cause what's actually a relapse of multiple sclerosis. So there are many things that can go into all of this when you're thinking about why you are or aren't having a relapse. Probably the number one reason, though, people have a relapse is because we're in the year 2016 and there's no excuse for not being on a medication if you haven't, been, if you haven't had problems with it. And they're not on a medication. They're either on something and not taking it as directed. So they're supposed to be on a drug twice a day and they're taking it once a day or not at all. They're supposed to be on a drug every other week and they're not taking it every other week. They're supposed to be on a drug three times a week and they're taking it once a week. All those kinds of reasons can put you at a risk for a relapse. If those medicines are designed to reduce your relapses, if you're not taking them as directed, then you're going to have a relapse. What do you do if you suspect a relapse? Well, of course, you want to talk to your doctor. Your doctor may or may not want to see you. They may or may not want to do a physical examination. They may or may not do an MRI to help them as well. We certainly do not need MRIs to know whether you're having a relapse or not, but sometimes it can be confusing. And depending on your other medications, your doctor may want to do that to make sure that that's actually what's happening. You want to make sure you have open lines of communication. But you want to start this with even before the relapse, having a relapse plan with your neurologist, saying, what are we going to do next time? I've been on this medicine, and it has worked or hasn't worked, or I haven't been on a med. What are we going to do next time? Because you don't want it to be 3 o'clock in the morning, and you call the answering service, and the doctor either doesn't remember, or it's their partner who has never seen you, and they have to go back. And you can tell them, go back to October 15th, 2014. On that day, I had an office visit, and we came up with our relapse plan. And that doctor goes there, and they're going to find in the note exactly what you talked to your doctor about. So you want to have that plan even beforehand. You want to be prepared so that you can uh, do it as well. Your doctor will probably may or may not order lab tests. They may order a chest x-ray to make sure you don't have pneumonia or an infection. They may make sure that you don't have infections with laboratory or basic lab tests as well. As I mentioned, MRI may or may not be ordered. How many people have seen their own MRI? How many people have not but wanted to? So that's very good because you should either have seen it or not seen it. But the only decision should be whether you want to see it or not. And so if you did, and there were a few who did raise their hand, go back to your neurologist, say, I want today's office visit to be about nothing else but covering my MRIs and talking about them. We use fancy words when we talk about MRIs. We talk about T1, which is a T1 weighted image, which is a certain type of image. And when we give gadolinium, we say with gadolinium, which is a heavy metal. And that shows brightness. And in this person, it shows brightness. that's showing they're having an active lesion, and they may be having symptoms of a relapse. They may be having this with no symptoms that they know about, or they may be having this where their thinking is a little bit off, but they don't seem to realize it. Because this person is having a relapse. And you can see that also in what we call T2-weighted imaging, which is where we look at the white spots. When, when people say plaques of MS, this is what they're talking about. But then a while later, if we looked at it again, and we looked at it without gadolinium or with gadolinium, and there was no brightness going on, then we say that's a T1 hypo-intensity, meaning there's been some loss of the nerves. That's not always a permanent loss. And it has an unfortunate term. Oftentimes, you'll hear it referred to as a black hole. I hate that term. The correct term is a T1 hypo-intensity. Firstly, not all black holes are black. Some are gray. And a lot of them are not permanent as well. And I just think it's not a useful term to be using when talking to people with multiple sclerosis. So what's an example of a relapse? So I'm going to give you an example here that actually happened. So this is a woman who had multiple sclerosis, and she started developing urethral pain. So that's pain in her private areas. And she went to urologists and gynecologists, and they couldn't figure out a reason. They looked, and they couldn't see anything that was happening. And they didn't understand why this was happening to her. 
But when you take a careful history and physical examination on this woman, you could tell exactly where the relapse was. In fact, she was describing it here, it was almost like a band-like sensation, kind of similar to the MS hug or partial transverse myelitis. And she would unfortunately been smoking actually since the age of 12. So a long history of smoking cigarettes as well. On examination, you could actually tell a sensation difference at the level of T7, which is vertebral body 7. We have known that smoking is bad for you for a long time. And in fact, this is a much older article that told us that smoking is bad for multiple sclerosis. So besides all the other health problems with smoking, it's bad for your MS. So when this woman had an MRI of her thoracic spine, you could actually see the white spot of where she actually had MS going on. And then when we gave that heavy metal, that dye, you could actually see that it lit up and it was bright, meaning that there was a new lesion going on there. So as opposed to this being a mystery diagnosis, she was actually just having a relapse of multiple sclerosis. And then we could treat it as such. So how do we treat them? Well, there's two FDA-approved ways of treating multiple sclerosis relapses. But remember, the best way to treat them is to never have them in the first place, to prevent them with your proactive medication. But our two ways that are FDA approved are using corticosteroids. So commonly we use something called IV methylprednisolone, also called IV solumedrol. We may sometimes use something called dexamethasone or decadron, and some people take high doses of oral steroids, not low doses. Low doses of steroids should never ever be used for an MS relapse. We have shown in scientific studies that it makes MS worse. So some people mix that same soy medrol, and it doesn't taste that good, it's a little bitter, and so they mix it with fruit smoothies and make a medrol smoothie. The other FDA approved way is using something either into the muscle or subcutaneous, so into the fat under the skin. It's called adrenocotropic hormone or ACTH or brand name HP Acthar gel. And those are the two FDA approved ways of treating MS relapses. There are other non-FDA approved ways, so we may use them, but they have not been gone through all the same studies and presented to the Food and Drug Administration for that. One is called IVIG or IGIV immunoglobulin, intravenous, so into the vein. And the other one is called plasma phoresis, also known as plasma exchange. So when we treat an exacerbation, the most common way is for a person to get solumedrol into the vein for three days to five days with or without oral prednisone taper afterwards. Sometimes, though, you could go to the emergency department. They could give you that first dose there, and actually the social worker or the case managers who are so important at the emergency department can help arrange for the following three to five days as well. But who shouldn't get infused like that? Who shouldn't go at home and get the infusions? Well, if your medical conditions are too unstable, if you've had steroid-induced psychosis where you've gone actually kind of like roid rage from the steroids and you probably don't want that to be happening at home. If your diabetes is too under control and you probably want to be monitored for insulin even if you don't normally take insulin. And then unfortunately Medicare traditionally was not covering this. There are some changes coming around but if your insurance doesn't cover it at home then you may have to go into an infusion center or into the hospital to get it as well. The other FDA-approved method is called ACTH. When do you use ACTH or ACFAR? Well, the FDA says you should use it whenever there's a relapse of MS. That's when it's approved. But in reality, because of various reasons, including the finances of healthcare, what happens is that ACTH is usually reserved for people who have tried solumedrol and had an inadequate response. They've either had problems where they didn't get fully better or they actually had side effects from the steroids as well or they have problems getting into the vein. And then ACTH could be given as a shot. And it's given either once a day for five days or once a day for 10 days, sometimes more rarely used even longer as well. So how do these relapse treatments work? Well, corticosteroids or solumedrol reduces inflammation, just much like an asthma reduces the swelling that's going on. Whereas ACTH what it does is it makes your body create its own natural corticosteroids. It stimulates the adrenal gland. These are glands that sit on top of the kidneys. And then they release your own natural corticosteroids. So then it's a similar method. It reduces inflammation. But there may also be another mechanism where it has effects 
on the melanocortin. So it's certain types of receptors in the body that are on immune cells as well as the nervous system cells. And there's a lot of research going into this as well. Now the third and final part of the MS CATIRs is symptomatic treatment. And remember I didn't say symptomatic drugs. So a lot of it does not involve medications. But here's where we're looking at what happens in between. Not during the attack, but in between when you're saying you're stable, but you may still be having symptoms of multiple sclerosis. This is simply a table showing most common ever or initial symptom of MS. And you'll notice that spinal cord sensory problems are the most common first and ever symptom of multiple sclerosis. The way to think about this is things that you can fix. And I would say organize it in your mind so you can go to your doctor's office and have three things that you want to talk about. These are my three main symptoms I want to talk to you about today. Don't have 50 things. You're not going to remember and they're not going to remember. And certainly don't wait till we're walking out the door and say, oh yeah, doc, one more thing. Bring up the important things first. We can talk about visible symptoms of MS. And that's when a person across the street could look at you and say, well, you're just not walking right. I don't know why, but you're not walking right. That's a visible symptom of MS. If you're feeling pain inside, other people can't see that necessarily. That's an invisible symptom of MS. And then there are things that you may know about and your partner may know about, but the rest of the population doesn't know about it. And those would be private symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So if it affects your bowel or bladder or sexual dysfunction, those are going to be the kinds of things or sleep dysfunction that your partner will know about, but, but other people won't. It's important to think about it and organize in this way because you should realize if you're feeling pain, your doctor only knows if you tell them. If you're not walking right, your doctor may be able to notice that on their own. And certainly if you're having a private symptom, unless you feel comfortable talking to your doctor about it, they're not going to know about it. And if you don't feel comfortable talking to your doctor, then it's time for you to find a doctor that you do feel comfortable talking with. You notice from before with Dr. Google, well, all these same relapses can also be symptoms of multiple sclerosis. It's just that they don't last for greater than 24 hours. We use a multimodal approach. We use communication. We use education. We use physical modalities. We use assistive technology. We use all of these things together to try to help your symptoms of multiple sclerosis. And when we think about this idea of the multiple sclerosis team approach rule, we can really think about each individual person as being their own M-star. But when you get those individual people together, like in a room that we're seeing here or like online, what you're doing is actually taking patient care, taking education, taking research, and making it together. And actually having all these individual M-stars in a community working together. And it's only by us working together and us coming together that we can really turn the multiple sclerosis team approach rule into the multiple sclerosis patient network where people with multiple sclerosis can help other people with multiple sclerosis. Now there's very good news. The good news is that in the 60s we had very few articles on MS. Now we open up our main journal for neurologists and 75%, three quarters of it, is about multiple sclerosis. That is so much closer to an effective treatment and an effective cure than we could ever believe before. In fact, neurologists were very creative people. You know what we call our main journal? Anybody know? Neurology. And guess what? It's green. You know what we call it? The Green Journal. But with that aside, when we look at how research has climbed since the 60s and how much we're seeing, we're seeing this asymptotic increase. And it's through this research that together we can make the multiple sclerosis team approach rule turn into the multiple sclerosis team approach reality. I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much.